simply because of the background I'm from. So I'm from a working class background. No one in my family has been to university before. No one in my family has even had a professional job before. Yeah, so, um, this is something that I'm trying to speak to my mom about as much as possible, actually, because I think it's very important that I know. My mom came to the country in the 90s, I guess, relative to what I'm going through at the moment. And I'll be very honest, I don't think I'm doing like a super great job. So when I was a fresher, the people I looked up to were also freshers. There was a real scramble for like committee roles and especially executive committee roles. And now I kind of see what the purpose of them was. I'd it never was... even properly had a conversation with an American person before. But when I asked her some very, very basic questions about Christianity, she couldn't answer them. So not only do I post, you know, Christian content on TikTok, but, oh, I, I, I kind of grew up in a walled garden environment or like an echo chamber. But then people were telling me, oh, that's a very like cliche Bible verse and people use that all the time. Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my podcast, Coffee Summy David Kwan, where I strive to give guests legacy worthy interviews that listeners can enjoy while cooking, commuting, relaxing, or walking their pets. We've made it past the misery of week five Lent term in Cambridge to the start of week six, although I've just heard that at the other place they are approaching the end of week six. Um, we are approaching 10,000 podcast downloads, and if you have been enjoying the discussions on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts, please do consider leaving a review and nominating a guest by contacting me via my link tree, David Kwan. For those new to the podcast, welcome and thank you for your engagement. Please know that I do not take your time and feedback for granted because when I started this podcast at a low point of my time in Cambridge, I was mostly nervous about humiliating myself. But I went ahead with this passion project based on three ideals, which still make up the content description for each podcast episode. First, a purpose of giving. Second, learning from others. And third, sharing of stories. I'll always be the first to admit my many, many inadequacies, and I'll almost certainly listen back to be amazed at how naive, if not wrong, I am in there as I continue to learn. But I genuinely maintain the deep conviction that this passion project if wholly true to the founding motivations about giving, learning, and sharing is a worthwhile pursuit. Seeing this uh, podcast on people's Spotify raps or receiving positive messages about all the wonderful guests as examples always put a big smile on my face. I cannot thank all the guests enough for their courage and insights. For now, I am excited to host my guests from the other place, Kwabina Osei. Kribina is a third-year history and politics student at Corpus Christi College, Oxford. He is currently vice president of the Oxford Law Society and has previously served on the committees of some of the largest societies in Oxford, including the Oxford Afri uh, Afro-Caribbean Society, the Oxford University Labour Club, and the Oxford Union. In 2022, Kurabina was listed as one of the UK's most outstanding African and Caribbean students in the 14th edition of the annual Future Leaders magazine. As a Black working class student who is the first in his family to attend university, Kurabina is passionate about promoting access and outreach to top universities such as Oxford. In his spare time, he posts content on student life as well as faith and study advice on his TikTok channel. Rabina, welcome to my podcast, Coffee Summit, David Kwan. Thank you so much. Um, glad to be here. Quite an impressive bio. Um, I was wondering, have you listened to any other episodes of uh, my podcast and what have you learned from the guests that you've listened to? Yeah, so um, I have. Um, it was actually through one of the episodes that featured someone else who also attends Oxford that actually made me think, you know, maybe it's worth getting involved in another podcast I think that this is just something that I'm trying out because it's like an area where I feel like I can really improve my confidence in so uh yeah is that Brian or DJ Dipper uh yeah it was DJ Dipper <laughs> well, but I do know Brian as well he's also really cool yeah yeah very uh very inspiring conversations I've learned a lot from both of them and I'm sure I'll learn a lot from you as well so I mean such an impressive bio and lots of involvements and Maybe I'll start somewhere slightly different. Um, what's your favorite Bible verse that you continue to go back to? My favorite Bible verse. Um, 
Hmm, I feel like this has changed a lot um, because I think a couple of years ago it used to be Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 but then people were telling me oh that's a very like cliche bible verse and people use that all the time. Um, I feel like I guess relative to what I'm going through at the moment I think one bible verse um, that really sticks with me is um, 1 Timothy 4 16 which basically says watch your life be your doctrine closely so that um you will save yourself and those who hear you and i'll be very honest i don't think i'm doing like a super great job of watching both closely but at the same time i understand its importance because of the fact that you can feel like a temptation to kind of act or do or say whatever you want but as you get older you realize that you know you can't necessarily do that because you have a responsibility to be a role model to other people which is why I think that Bible verse is so important. I feel like I am very self-conscious of, maybe not self-conscious, but I am very conscious of a lot of my actions. And I feel like it kind of shows in the things that I do. So you mentioned earlier that, yes, I do have a TikTok account. And I'm not sure if people have really noticed this, but I am quite careful with what I post. I try to make sure it's quite PG. So I don't post any, like... um. I don't post any videos using sounds that have swearing in them. I try not to refer to any, like, you know, um, potentially offensive content. I try and keep it relatively accessible for everyone while still keeping it relatable. So, uh, yeah, bit of a long answer, but yeah. Um, Christianity is obviously faith-based, not work-based, um, but... How 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 do you see in your personal life these two kind of in, interrelate? Do you like, for example, would you say that because of the faith, the good works stem from it, or do you think, yeah, how do you weigh the proportion between the two, if any? Um, I think it's quite challenging actually because I feel like I'm a kind of person who thinks that both are, are important, but I think over the past couple of years, I've really struggled to find a balance between them. Um, so just like a bit of like a background about my faith. Um, I grew up, um, I was baptised within the Church of England, but I never really attended Church of England services. Rather, it was kind of like a mix between attending a Church of England school growing up and then going to Pentecostal services on a Sunday. So, um, I think whilst in the school, I learned a lot about, you know, Church of England doctrine and tradition, whereas at um, church, so my mum's Pentecostal church, I would basically see how much it was dead by, you know, personal devotion and the Holy Spirit. So I think in relation to faith and works, it was quite confusing because uh, there were a lot of mixed messages. So... um. I had the impression that you had to make sure your works were intact if you wanted to be, I suppose, saved. Because growing up in church, I'd always hear about, you know, like God punishing people who didn't do what he wanted and God just sending people to hell. But I never really learned much about his love or his grace. So I think because of that, I grew up with a very works-based mentality. But I think as of now, I'm currently in a space where I'm learning that works doesn't re works don't really mean anything if you're not if you don't really have much of a I guess sentimental reason behind why you're doing it. And so I think it's two things that you need to um it's two things that I think you need to work on. So it's like not only are works important, but the reason behind them is just as important as well. You don't really do things because you're doing them for God, but rather you do them out of a love for God. So I think that is how I would interpret that. That's awesome. And um, would you say that you often go back to scripture and do you have a routine with that? Yeah, so um, basically the routine that I have is um, I tend to do what's called a quiet time. And that's when you read the Bible literally first thing in the morning. So as soon as you wake up, you would read it. And basically the way I would do that is there's like a structure you use called SOAP, which stands for scripture, observation, application, and practical. So basically you would read the scripture 
then you would basically look at a bit more context behind it. You would then think about how that applies to you and then what you would then do practically as a result. So that's normally how a quiet time goes. And normally it's the first thing I do in the morning. Um, in the past, I have like struggled to keep up um, that routine a lot because of different circumstances. But I think something that really something that really comforts me about Christianity or about faith is the fact that that is always there for you no matter what is that no matter how difficult life difficult life gets and how much you want to numb out I feel like I rest easy in the fact that you know not only is the bible there for you to refer to in difficult life situations but just because let's say you're going for a period where you're numbed out and you don't really want to do much it's not as if God cast you off because I know for a fact that love God's love is not a feeling but it's more of a promise you know God promises to be faithful to you he doesn't leave you when like you sin he doesn't leave you when you're finding things difficult he meets you where you're at and he basically tries to well, I'm not trying. He basically lifts you out of where you're from if you really, really ask him. So, uh, yeah. That's great. And obviously, we just had Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday is a reminder to live simply, to take joy in the simple things in life, to remember that um, we are dust. And I was wondering, have you had any contemplations about Ash Wednesday and the start of Lent season? And is there any perhaps um, changes in actions that you intend to take or have already taken? Yeah, so um, because I grew up mostly attending Pentecostal services, I never really like seriously took part in Ash Wednesday. I only really did it when I was in primary school because obviously in the Church of England, Ash Wednesday celebrated. Um, and we would talk about giving up things um they weren't necessarily like too big on it I guess because of the fact that we were young children um I feel like probably a more prolific memory for me was Shrove Tuesday so the day before okay. which most people know is pancake day because we still we I still celebrate that to this day um and I feel like I don't know it's more of a um debaucherous message so it's more the case where you use up all of like the rich foods and the fatty foods for that day and then the next day when Lent starts that's when you begin to give up things but I don't think we've I don't think I've ever like intentionally observed it mm -hmm. um yeah I, I guess I wanted to start with faith because I think it from, from from my kind of research and my kind of understanding of you it really is the kind of grounding and the motivation for why you start things and I I understand that faith doesn't always easy to talk about and it's a kind of a personal relationship with God and it's a constant kind of journey through that process and I was wondering do you currently have any questions I, I don't mean questioning God I mean do you have any questions about how to apply your faith in practice and perhaps any biblical stories for example this morning I had a chat with the Christian friend who literally believes that the world is 6,000 years old, like taking the Bible quite literally. But obviously he studies science as well. So he understands that, well, the scientific evidence suggests it's long, but he still believes that the world is 6,000 years old. And I was wondering, do you have any kind of, um, yeah, these kind of questions that you you constantly think about from the Bible? Um. Well, yeah, most definitely. I think that most of what I know about Christianity, even though I've been going to church my whole life, most of what I know about Christianity, I only learned when I was about, what, 17 years old. Um, I think that something I do question a lot sometimes is the fact that, you know, why God allows so much suffering to happen. And what's funny about it is I partially already know the answer. So it's like, we know God allows suffering to happen, because suffering is just a part of the human experience. When you read the Bible, not even Jesus was spared suffering. Contrary to what most people believe, Jesus wasn't happy when he went to the cross, but he still did it anyway, because it allowed the grace of good to be fulfilled. And so 
I feel like maybe most people don't understand this, but suffering is what causes other things within God's plan to happen. So if, let's say the building that I'm in right now, people had to suffer to build it, right? But because they suffered, I now have somewhere to live. And I think it's the same way in which, you know, all the other aspects of human life um, exist. Um, and that's because of the fact that, once again, it is just a simply a part of the human experience. There isn't a single person in this world who isn't going to go through some kind of suffering. And the Bible says there'll come a point where God comes back and creates a new heaven and a new earth and will take away all of our suffering. So I think that finally there's a verse in the Bible that says suffering produces endurance, which produces character, which brings about hope. So even through the trials that I'm currently going through now, I know that although it feels you know hard right now, it's helping to build my character and that will bring about hope. Hope in the sense that what if the story that I'm going through, what if what I'm going through now will create like a story that will bring someone else to God? I never really thought about it like that before, but I think that's something I'm slowly starting to come to recollection with. So um yeah, suffering's still a big question though, because in the midst of it you kind of think about why it's happening. But I think logically the Bible makes it very clear why it happens. I went to a Christian school and um, servant leadership was a massive concept. And obviously for someone like you who have excelled across a number of different areas in different societies and, you know, such as being featured in the Future Leaders magazine, how do you interpret leadership? Um, how would you define it and how has it evolved over the years? Yeah, um, I think this is a really interesting question because I think my notion of leadership has definitely changed a lot. Um, I am someone who um, associates leadership with ambition. I think if you're not ambitious, then you can't really be a leader because otherwise you're going to lead something that's going to end up you know, being stagnant. Um, I think, however, a leader is someone who should be able to connect and relate to the people that they're leading. So I saw this um, like post on Instagram and you've got like, where well, you've got like these people, they're pulling a rope and a boss is someone who's telling them to pull the rope, right? Whereas a leader is at, literally at the front of the line, pulling the rope with them. So the way I interpret that is a leader is someone who identifies with people's struggles and still motivates them to keep on going. Whereas a boss is someone who just forces you to do it and isn't really empathetic towards how hard it might be. So I think leadership, I feel like that word is thrown about a lot, but there's a lot of um, different qualities that come with it. So let's say, let's zoom in on maybe your leadership at the Oxford University Labour Club, for example. How does mm -hmm. that differ from your leadership in uh, the Oxford Afro-Caribbean uh, Society, for example? Yeah, well, I mean, they were, first of all, they were different positions and that I took at different times of stages of my life. So um, I was a junior PR officer for the Oxford African and Caribbean Society first. And I think that role was quite intense. So, um. That was kind of my first introduction to like actually having a committee role outside of, you know, my degree. And it was very, very intense because I was expected to do lots and lots of really hard tasks uh, within a very strict deadline. And at times I thought, oh, this isn't going to be possible. Like, this is really hard. But then I thought about it. And at the time, I thought, you know, it's really, really difficult to get a position like this on committee and I have the privilege of having it. So let me just do what was, you know, what I was told to do. So um, I, I really tried to give my best to that role, but I feel like I failed a lot. But through that failure, I learned a lot as well. And in comparison with the Labour Club, that was a lot different because once I'd finished with uh, the, Afri the ACS, the African and Caribbean Society, the fact that I'd been able to um, achieve so much in a role like that gave me more confidence to keep on going for stuff. 
I feel that people think this is quite, you know, opportunistic. But I feel that when you're from a background like mine, you have to be. Because I come from a school that, you know, really didn't have these sort of opportunities at all. And as much as I would have loved to do stuff that, you know, um, like model United Nations or, you know, youth politics, my school just did not have those sort of opportunities at all. So when I came to Oxford and those opportunities were almost abundant, I just couldn't help but get involved. And so I feel like the more that I did, the more that I improved my leadership skills. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's such a wonderful, like Cambridge and Oxford, having all these societies and you get to meet um, great people through it, most importantly. So can you, Susie, so, so when you first joined these societies, um, I'm sure there are people that you look up to. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're comfortable mentioning anyone, but even if you don't mention their name, could you maybe share about what a, what qualities they had, what example they've shown that have influenced you as a time uh, as a fresher, for example? Yeah, um, I think this is actually um a bit surprising because a lot of the people who I feel like I looked up to or who I influenced by, who or who I were inf who I was influenced by, uh, were actually all the same age as myself so when I was a fresher the people I looked up to were also freshers and I think what was different about these guys though was that compared to myself who had literally just entered Oxford and didn't really have much of a clue how things worked they by comparison were quite proactive so they already had an idea of the kind of things they wanted to get involved in um I do remember like at some point, I think it might have been like um, Trinity term, there was a real scramble for like committee roles and especially executive committee roles. And now I kind of see what the purpose of them was. It was like, the reason these committee roles exist is so that people get experience, leadership experience put on their CVs, which will then help them out with like internship applications and job applications. And what I found really impressive about a lot of people um was that they really had this on lock from the start I didn't really start investing in this until like my final term of first year because when I came I was still trying to figure out Oxford I wasn't having in my mind oh I've got to apply for this internship I've got to apply for that scheme etc I wasn't thinking about that stuff but I feel like being alongside people who are not only very ambitious but also quite um uh also quite like meticulous in their planning of their time I feel like that kind of encouraged me to do the same for myself is that why three months ago you wrote the article socialists shouldn't work in high-paid jobs should they um was that why uh or, or is that connected I think it's partially partially connected I think I wrote that article kind of more in response to oh no I remember why I wrote it now it was actually in response <laughs> it was actually in, re in response to an Oxfest okay there was it... like this Oxfest thread that was going about talking about how it didn't make sense that these very liberal Oxford students mm -hmm. were who were advocating for things such as climate change and socialism were then you know bragging on LinkedIn about like the internship that they've got at this bank or this firm mm -hmm. and then it started like a whole debate saying yeah but like first of all you would do the same if it was you and second of all that's just the way that our country works you can't really you know it's not like we can leave them to like starve on the street obviously you've got like some people who really do believe in this and then go on to join like socialist organizations once university finishes but on the on the most level it's not realistic to say oh you know I'm leftist and I'm going to stay that way you are going to be you are going to find these jobs appealing because not not only how much they pay but because of the status they hold in our society as well so this idea of, you know, corporate sellout, you know, it comes back again and again on, you know, university campuses. And it obviously it is a discourse that we all have to think about as we make these career decisions. Um, given kind of your background, 
um, and given kind of your currently, um, I think, I believe you're doing corporate uh, uh, commercial law, how did you kind of weigh up and do you, do, do you subscribe to some of the criticisms that others may um, subject you to? Is that in relation to um, what being a corporate sellout? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't personally completely subscribe to it, but I was just wondering how do you deal with that? in your own kind of life and your own decision making yeah well i mean i feel like for me it's a bit easier because of simply because of the background i'm from so i'm from a working class background no one in my family has been to university before no one in my family has even had a professional job before so i feel like i have you know i'm in a place to immediately dismiss those criticisms because by if we look at the logic of such criticism, I shouldn't even be in a place like Oxford. And if I was to make it somewhere like here, you've got to think about it. Me making it to a university like Oxford, would that make me a sad out to the roots that I'm from? So, you know, you wouldn't call me someone who has rejected their working class roots just because of the fact that I decided to go to university. That doesn't make sense. So in the same way, if I decide, oh, I want to go into law and I want to go into a high paid law job, that mm -hmm. wouldn't then mean, oh, I've rejected my roots once again to become a corporate sellout. I don't think that's what it means, because when you're from a background like mine, where people have not had, you know, much money, the negative connotations just kind of disappear. And I feel like this is especially the case in the Afro-Caribbean community. If anything, we are being strongly encouraged to go for these jobs because these jobs are theoretically what will bring about generational wealth if that money is handled correctly. So I think those criticisms only really come about in relation to students who are already quite privileged. But for students who have lacked those privileges, I think that being able to enter corporate environments and being able to start a career is really life-defining. Mm. And do you have any long-term plans for what you want to achieve or is there just a general direction that you're heading? So is that career related? Uh, career or life, you can interpret it in whatever way. Um, well, I mean, I don't really have like a super long-term plan, but as of now, I would like to try and gain a training contract so that I can enter the world of law and qualify as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then once I've achieved that, then you know, we'll see what happens next. Obviously, I've heard of people continuing in law because they really enjoy it. I am aware it's quite difficult and there are a lot of unhappy lawyers out there. So um, I'm taking all of that into account. So, uh, yeah. What other factors do you consider when you make these big uh, life decisions concerning the direction that you'll be taking? I think something that's really important to consider is where you currently are and not just where you're currently at, but also where the people around you are also currently at. So um, in relation to law, I mentioned earlier, I would be the first person ever in my family to have a professional job and looking at other people around me. So not only my family, but my friends too. I feel like getting a job like that was really defined to them that it is possible because I feel like they believe that it's been gatekeeped for a very long time. I think there are misconceptions regarding, you know, the entire social mobility process. Because um, for me, it even goes back to what A levels I was picking. Um, because I remember my mom was really unhappy with the A levels I picked. Because I think to her, the idea was if you do maths or any science subject, you're basically set up for success. I feel like by going to Oxford and studying history and politics, I've kind of proved that that's not the case. But um, at the time, like my mom was really unhappy because I told her I was going to do English, history, politics and economics at the time. And she was really unhappy, especially with history, um, because she didn't see, you know, what job that would lead to. And obviously my family is from Ghana and back in Ghana, because Ghana is a developing country, they want they put more emphasis on subjects that basically have a high return on investment. So such as maths and sciences, um, because those jobs 
those will lead to jobs that will eventually build up the country. Whereas in the UK, it's not like that. There are more opportunities here and people have more leeway to do whatever, you know, they enjoy. So I feel like not listening to my parents in that case was a really, really good idea because it then led me here. And so I think in going for a commercial law role, it's kind of proving to, you know, my community once again, that for, you know, someone who is black, who's from a working class background, who is first gen, it is possible for them to reach those heights. Yeah, the return on investment, uh, human capital theory, which I'm not sure if you studied much at all. but it's a Oh, no, I don't know what that is, actually. Yeah, it might be worthwhile to look into it, but um, essentially it's just that kind of economic metrics of trying to value and quantify education. It's a big part of my um, degree, which is uh, really fascinating. I mean, do you want to, well, so, so have you spent considerable time in Ghana or have you visited Ghana much? And what's kind of your connection there? So um, my family is from Ghana. Uh, for myself, I've visited once, and that was in 2016. That was a very interesting experience. I think that in a lot of ways, um, in a lot of ways, it was interesting to learn about, you know, where actually is home. But at the same time, I feel like having seen what it's like there, I have a lot to be grateful for here in the UK, so, which is why I do, you know, appreciate my mum moving here in order to basically give us a better life. And I feel like given the economic situation in Ghana, it made a lot of sense. So when did your mother decide to make the move from Ghana to the UK? And have you talked much to her about the um difficulties perhaps of that process yeah um this is something that i'm trying to speak to my mom about as much as possible actually because i think it's very important that i know so from what i do know my mom came to the country in the 90s and that was for economic reasons um it wasn't because of you know any it wasn't because of any like feelings she had towards the uk it's just that economic prospects in Ghana were very poor at the time. So she moved to the UK searching for a better life. Right. And um, I believe you have a younger brother. Um, how old is I... he? Yeah. So how, how old is he? And um, what's kind of your relationship like with him? Like, do you play around do you fight a lot do you argue or does he just start yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so my younger brother um is 18 uh he's currently studying business management at lincoln university um i'll be honest uh growing up we didn't have the best relationship we always we used to fight quite a lot but um as we got older and then lockdown happened that changed and um we got a lot closer and it's been nice, I guess, just us both getting older and kind of bonding together on lots of different things. So, like, we, like, all the takeaway and watch Netflix all the time. And that's something that I really, really value because it's like I get to see my brother's opinions on certain social issues. Um, we used to watch a lot of, like, historical films. And I feel like it's just so awesome, like, watching my brother learn about all of these things for the first time. Um because I feel like history is really, really interesting, but school makes it boring. So I feel like through watching these movies, it really, really, it really is a bonding moment between us. And I really like um, cherish and value those moments because they're not very often, they're not very frequent anymore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I was just, um, I, I kind of knew that you had a younger brother mostly from, you know, the the YouTube video of you winning uh, top 150 UK most outstanding African Caribbean students and new graduates. And there was a comment uh, who said, uh, who, who kind of said, you're an amazing young man. Uh, so the person said, I've known him since he was a toddler. His family and mine lived on the same street. Corbina, his younger brother and my sons went to the same primary and secondary school. His mother looked after my sons when I first moved in as their neighbour. Uh, Kurabina always had this special quality about him that made him stand out. He's a very intelligent young man, a genius, a pride to us all, and a role model, which is obviously incredibly positive. And I think that there's many components in there that 
really caught my my eye and I think how your mother I don't know if you even know who I'm talking about but how your mother had looked after uh your neighbor's son I guess that shows a lot of kind of character and warmth and the kindness and the kind of good qualities that you have talked about you know in, in Christianity you know love your neighbor as well and I just thought it was really beautiful reading that comment and getting a glimpse of the warmth that your family shows. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, because first of all, I do know who wrote that comment. And, uh, yeah, she's always, she's been a very close family friend of ours. Um, in relation to um, my mom looking after her neighbor's kids, that was something she did at the time. Um, this is when I was a lot younger, so... Uh, we always had like different kids in our house because my mom used to do child minding and that was really really cool uh, because it was like we were never really like alone so we always had friends over which I guess was pretty cool Um, but I feel like as well as that being a Christian tenet it's also kind of an African thing too so um, this is actually something I'm exploring for my dissertation but it's the idea that compared to the west that has a more nuclear family model. So, you know, a mother, a father, and two kids. In Africa, children are raised more collectively. So I don't know if you've heard of the saying, it takes a whole village to raise a child. Um, with, um, you know, within Africa, the extended family, as well as, you know, friends, neighbors, etc., they're seen as just as important as the mother and the father. So like, in relation to, you know, the African diaspora in the UK, that's been replicated in a lot of ways, including within my own family. So we have this tenet that, you know, even your mum's friend, for example, is your auntie. Your dad's friend is your uncle, even if they're not. And the children of your parents' friends are your cousins, even if you're not actually related. So, um, yeah, there is a much more collective atmosphere. I feel like there are, that does come with its problems, though. What problems? So, for example, um, one problem that it can come with is just in relation to how I think children are raised. I think maybe this is something that will probably change with our generation. But um, my mum has told me um, in the past about you know, how um, she was raised as a child. And I've noticed that there was actually a lot of neglect, maybe because in terms of, you know, how we see it in the West, it isn't right that, you know, a mother wouldn't be directly responsible for raising their child. But in Africa, in Ghana, like, it's very normalised. Like, my mum was raised by um, her aunties and her uncles, and her mum and dad didn't really have much of um, a role in raising her. And this is something I've always wondered why this is, you know, I've not really um, explored this much, but I feel like this is some, as I mentioned before, this is something that kind of stops with us because of the fact that we have grown up in a completely different culture. We've grown up in the UK. We've been exposed to Western ways of thinking. And so I feel like we're in a position to make a decision based on not only what we know about, you know, our culture, but also about psychology and mental health as well. So I feel like as Gen Zs, we're really in like a good position to be the best parents for our children. So when you talk to other peers who've had similar kind of backgrounds as you, um, and I, uh, and you take it in any way, whether that's culturally, whether that's in terms of class or religion. Do you find that you are able to connect with those people far more because you just kind of know, or do you feel like even amongst people of similar backgrounds, there are more kind of unique family specific things? I think it's a bit of both. So it's like whenever I meet someone who's from a similar background, I feel like we connect on some things, but then there are other things that still make us quite unique. So like, for example, I um, went to this um, law firm open day and I met another aspiring lawyer who was, you know, very similar to myself in many ways. 
but I think we were similar in the sense that we were both from the same country and we were both from a working class background and obviously we were both black but at the same time I think things that made us very different was the fact that um, our education experience had been very different so the case where um, he had gone to a school that was able to support him a lot more when it came to extracurricular activities and as a result he had come across as a lot more I guess I don't know if this is the correct word, but cultured than I was. So, um, and I feel like also because of that, he was a lot better at making bonds with the other people who were there. And I just wasn't because I feel like I lacked that social training. So, um, yeah, there was still like some, there were still some things that set us apart. So a bit of um, Bordeaux <laughs> readings. Um, yes. Given the different kind of identities that you have, so if you were, if you had like 30 seconds or a minute to introduce yourself, what are the things that you would kind of mention as part of who you are then? Oh, this is a hard one. It's like, it's like being asked to an elevator pitch. Um, okay, so I'd say, first and foremost, I'm a Christian who cares very strongly about my faith. And no matter whether I'm doing well or badly in life, that's something that is always going to be there. That is my grounding. And as a result of having that grounding, I've been able to do a lot of amazing things um, through God. So first of all, I'm a student at Oxford University who studies history and politics. And I've also had the pleasure of doing things such as meeting King Charles III. I've been listed as one of the top students in the country. And also I'm currently vice president of the Oxford Law Society. And moving forward, I'm really interested in um, pursuing a career in commercial law because I feel like I have qualities such as, you know, high motivation, resilience, and also positivity that I feel would help me do really well within a role like that. I don't know if that was good. I don't know what you thought of that. No, that's great. Um, obviously, I did put you on the spot for that, but yeah, it, it's really um, yeah. So it's, it's always fascinating to hear what people um bring up because you know there there are so many things that make up who we are and define us, and and it was interesting. I guess that first and foremost, you put your identity as a Christian that you you have the identity in Christ as a solid grounding. Um, which is yeah, um. Okay, so you got to Oxford, um, as he said, not everyone there has had your kind of background and it uh, may have been a bit of a cultural kind of shock. If you think back to you in that first kind of week, freshest week, what would you say are two things that have really changed, either a mindset, either a mentality, either something, you know, material, physical, or per uh, perceptions of other people, but what's changed? I think my perceptions of other people and my perception of myself has changed a lot um, because I came into university um, kind of like out of sixth form feeling like, you know, I've entered this new atmosphere where I'm surrounded by people who have had access to every single privilege. And um, my teachers weren't very supportive of me going to Oxford. So I was kind of surrounded by people whose teachers have really like, been very um influential in helping them to get here however as i mentioned earlier i think being at oxford since then has really allowed me to raise my standards for myself i never would have considered even going for the things that you know i've managed to achieve here because i just thought they would be far too difficult to do like at the start if you told me like when i started in first year that i'd end up becoming vice president of the law society i'd be like no way how would I even get there? I'd have to fight off so much competition. I'd have to work so hard. My degree is already difficult. Why would I do all of this on top of it? But no, I think since being here, I've actually proved a lot to myself about how capable I am of doing these things. And I think even from a spiritual perspective as well, I feel like there's been a lot more struggle than there's been success. But that struggle has kind of taught me how important it is to be a Christian because I feel like a lot of people have this wrong idea and they think that oh 
being a Christian means, first of all, you have a problem-free life. That's not true. I've had problem after problem after problem. And secondly, I feel like people think it means you're quite naive and you're, you know, quick to believe something that science has already proven is untrue or whatever. And first of all, I think science only further proves the existence of God. Secondly, I don't think that just because you're a Christian, you're naive. Because it's like, that doesn't make sense. Like, I'm in the same university as you. So me being a Christian doesn't make me less intelligent or too trusting or too naive or whatever. Because if I'm still been able to achieve these things, that means the same potential that these, you know, God denies have, I also have. So I feel like I've really been able to move forward in that area. And whilst I'll be honest and say, you know, the growth didn't really happen as much outwardly. It was more of a change in transition and mindset and really learning how to endure. I think that was a strength that I really developed throughout university. What did you have to endure though? What did I have to endure? You mean spiritually? Uh, well, well, I guess we, we've talked a lot about challenges and suffering. Um, oh, okay. Obviously, whatever you're comfortable to share, but like, what, what have you found particularly challenging either recently or in the past few years? Maybe perhaps beyond just the workload at Oxford. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, okay, well, obviously the workload is challenging. Yeah. Um, but I feel like it's been, it was kind of hard, even like to this day, it's still tough to kind of um, manoeuvre the difference in lifestyle between university at home and home. So, um, and I think my family also found this quite hard as well, because I remember during Freshers Week, they were calling me a lot. And I could not pick up all the time. Um, and I remember I told someone this and they were like, oh, I take it you're the first in your family to go to university. And I'm, not, and I'm like, well, yeah, um, because I feel like not only was I not used to it, my parents were also not used to it. But then as time uh, went on and, you know, um, serious things started happening at home, um, I found it really tough because I found that, you know, not many people in Oxford at all would be able to relate to something like this. I actually remember something that happened at the Oxford Union. Um, this was during their ball in Trinity term last year. I was working that ball when I heard some like really horrible news from home. And the worst part was I couldn't tell anyone. I don't think, first of all, I don't think there's anyone in the union who I even trust enough to tell this. And second of all, there's also no one in the union who would even be able to relate to something as difficult as this. So I feel like the challenges that I've faced in my life outside of uni have been kind of exacerbated by the fact that Oxford is a place full of so much privilege. And therefore, a lot of the people who go here are never going to be able to relate to something like the things that I've experienced. So that made, must have made you feel quite lonely and alienated at the time. And well, I, I would assume a lot of doubts as well. How were you able to then work through that and, and to both recognize the reality of the situation while also moving forward in a positive direction? Yeah, I think church was something that really helped actually. Um, just so just for like background um, my church is based in London um, but there are some members of the church who um, are resident in Oxford and so obviously I was really really close to them and I think just having them kind of as people to rely on almost like family away from family um, just sharing all of those things with them not only did it make me feel you know that someone was listening it also kind of made me grounded once again because we basically submitted all my feelings and all my thoughts to what the bible says and i feel like moving forward that then helped me to face those challenges the right way instead of just kind of succumbing to my emotions and then acting impulsively and then causing something really bad to happen because i've been tempted to do that before i'm very lucky that i didn't because if i had done those things I probably wouldn't have ended up, you know, achieving the things I did. Rather, I'd probably be known in Oxford for being a very bad person instead. But I'm very glad it didn't come to that point. 
Yeah. What what do you think? Um other people's perceptions are of you in the Oxford kind of political scene. What what kind of in the Oxford political scene? Yeah. Um I'll be very honest. I feel like um I feel like within the Oxford political scene, I'm not really very present in it anymore. I I think last year I was, because obviously I was on the SECI's committee. Um, even still, I didn't really like socialize loads because it was like I I don't know why I didn't, but um, I guess my I feel like people's perceptions of me are that I'm like way too trusting because um I didn't I actually ran for Seki's committee more than once, um, but the first time I ran, um, uh, basically my application there was something wrong with my application, and um. Well, we don't a hundred percent know what happened, but basically, I my application I had accidentally I put down secretary instead of secretary's committee, and no one knows how it happened. I thought, okay, maybe it's because you know I've been quite tired, but other people think the form was deliberately changed by another person. Um, this same person then tried to make me give in my nomination form when the office desk of the union was closed which would which would have been an electoral offense um someone had to stop me from doing it because i had no idea what i was doing um i feel like people secretly still make fun of me for that because um i feel like they all found it quite funny but i was quite embarrassed so maybe i'm always going to be known as you know the person who famously ran the secretary instead of secretary's committee so um yeah I think that I think I wouldn't say I'm like a Beanock or whatever. Quite far from it actually, because of the fact that I've made a lot of mistakes and I don't think I'd be worthy of, you know, ever getting to like a high position within like the Oxford Union or anything like that, because I don't feel like I am um, I don't know what the word is, but it's like I'm not politically agile enough i think i i I think i'd still need a lot of guidance i i'm not really someone who can really like be self-determined in this space i'm not someone who can really like you know work how these find out how these systems work on my own especially because i'm from like a background that doesn't you know have these things Mm -hmm. so yeah, I mean, I mean, the Oxford Union, Cambridge Union is always an interesting place uh, for a lot of um, politics. I mean, they are political organisations and elections always bring out both the best and worst in people. And I, I think the, the the gossipy kind of culture that can be prevalent in these places during those times um, is really, really difficult. Um, but for you to have... I guess, put yourself forward, um, even if it was actually for a secretary. I think that's uh, at the very least brought about a very uh, nice story to, 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 to share and to reminisce about. So I hope you kind of look back to those moments with um, a lot of uh, fulfillment and happiness. I think that's all a part of our journey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I always think about it because it's like, I'm very glad I still did it. Like, I'm glad I still like got onto Seki's committee because um. It's something that like I'm always going to remember. I still have like the picture from the debate and everything, and I guess you know it's something to show my grandkids at least. So um yeah. So speaking of your grandkids, um uh, before we get there, um there, there there's another line we got to get to. But how do okay. you how do you kind of um consider? Or do you have any philosophies when it comes to personal life, perhaps dating, relationships, in comparison to like career, your aspirations? I don't know. Um, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, okay. I think I get what you're trying to say. I think for me, I have quite a conservative view on this. So um, I'm not a conservative. Um, I'd like to think I'm politically quite liberal. Um, but when it comes to these things, it's like you've got to be careful. Um, just because I grew up around a lot of like things such as teenage pregnancies and family breakdown and things like that and I basically realized I've got to be really careful Um, because I think our parents told us at quite a young age you know 
they basically maintain that you are not even to look in the direction of the opposite gender unless you have until you have your life sorted out so until you've got your degree and until you've got your job don't even think about it mm. and when i was younger i used to really disagree because it was like there are people in the year four who have boyfriends and girlfriends even kids tv shows this all the time so how comes we can't do it but it was something that i guess i subconsciously listened to because um someone actually asked me not that long ago like is there any girl here that you like and i said no but when I said no, I really I realized that I hadn't been focused on that at all. I'd been focused on, you know, trying to establish myself. So I think maybe as I get older, you know, once you know my education's finished, then I have a job. That's something I'm really going to begin to think about. But I think going even further than that, I think that before we even get to that stage of, you know, dating, there's stuff that I've got to, you know, work out. I've got to make sure that I'm okay, you know, mentally and spiritually, because I feel like it would be a big disservice to both people if, you know, I'm carrying lots of trauma and baggage from my past. And instead of dealing with that, I'm just kind of projecting it onto other people. I really, really don't want that to happen, which is why I'm currently working on myself and I'm trying to make sure that, you know, I'm okay with past traumas and that I've healed from those things before I then bring someone else into a relationship. So I, I first say I really respect your view. And um, in, in a sense, I'm also, um, I, I think, conservative in that regard. And I, I, I personally don't engage in the kind of casual scene at all. But places like the Oxford Union or like, you know, it, it, it's relatively more liberal, especially when it comes to uh, kind of dating and stuff and I was wondering did you have any challenges navigating that and were, were, did you ever feel like you were um, you were odd or you were not like social enough to, to kind of fit in that kind of liberal scene no because I kind of saw what it was um, I might get in trouble for saying this but basically it was kind of, from what I saw, it was kind of an environment where people were trying to like, people were opportunistic in the sense that they were trying to kiss up to other people in order to get to a certain place. And I didn't really want any part of that, which is probably why I was seen as, I don't know, very unpopular within, I don't know, Seki's committee or whatever. But for me, it was like, it really wasn't that deep. Mm. It wasn't the case where, you know, I'm going to make alliances with people and then hurt those same people later on in order to get where I want to be. I don't, I'm really not that kind of person. And that would contradict everything that, you know, I believe in Christianity. So I feel like it wasn't worth doing that in the long run, even if it did mean I'd like walk into every shift, do my shift and then leave. And don't get me wrong, I did, I did have friends, you know, who are part of the Oxford Union, who were in the Oxford Union. But I wasn't prepared to be that ruthless when it came to like relationships and stuff. So, uh, yeah. So one day the goal is to get married and have a stable family, a uh, and have your village to raise your kid. Is that uh, simplistic? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know if the village thing would still apply. I think it would be very different uh, because I think as opposed to my parents, who you know are very African uh they're friends with other Africans they have an African mindset they have a they uh, follow African culture I think I'd be a lot different because um obviously London is a multicultural place and I would want you know my future life and the life of my future family to reflect that diversity so I would want my children to grow up around you know people of all different kinds of races you know ideally and I thought about this, I'd like to send my kids to an international school. I want to work, you know, in an international workplace, so like an international law firm, but, you know, you're exposed to people of all different cultures. And I feel like, I don't know, my parents will probably really hate this idea, but to me, I find it's really important because I feel like the world is becoming more globalised, and I think tribalism is something that is really bad because 
that basically suggests that you know your race and your culture specifically is better than every single other one and i don't think that's necessarily true i wouldn't attune such importance to culture in that respect but rather i think that there's something that can be learned from every different culture which is why i'd want my future life to have that sort of international um exposure mm -hmm. do you feel like you've always kind of valued that diversity or is that growing as the, the more you read the more you write the more you interact with other people yeah i think that this is something that oxford has played a big role in once again because i mean before even coming here there were certain type there were certain you know ethnic ethnicities and cultures that i'd never even spoken to before like i'd never even properly had a conversation with an american person before and i think coming from a school that was predominantly black mm. i was just surrounded by one kind of person and i think what people don't understand is that a school full of black people is not diverse a school full of white people is also not diverse so i think the reason i have this feeling is because growing up i was just so i feel like not really sheltered but it was kind of like oh i i kind of grew up in a walled garden environment or like an echo chamber where everyone kind of thought the same because the vast majority of people in my secondary school were christian they were black working class and christian so we all thought the same way about a lot of things but then coming to somewhere like oxford where your beliefs are actually in the minority it changes a lot of things and whilst it can feel like a culture shock at first you find that there's actually a lot to learn from the people around you and that's not just a result of talking to people it's also going to events running for things you know posting things online like through my TikTok, for example i've met so many new people as a result of just putting myself out there and i really want this to continue because i feel like there's just so much to learn and benefit from by looking at the experiences of other people even talking to you in this podcast is an example of that i think <laughs> that's wonderful um, I, i've already learned a lot from you as well so thank you so much for that um, so the podcast is intended to be a legacy worth interview, you know, uh, hopefully it captures a snapshot of some of the thoughts that you have at the moment and understand that things will evolve and things will change. And that's entirely why I think in 10, 20, 30 years time, we can hopefully both look back to this recording and find great meaning in what we're currently thinking as a student. Is there anything else that you want to be covered in this recording or else I've got a couple of final questions? um well i mean okay so for my 10 20 30 years self in the future hmm. i would probably like to think hmm, it's a hard one because it's like yourself in the future is going to hear this and think that like what um <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, nothing really comes to mind, I'll be honest. I think you should just go ahead with the questions that you had. So I guess second to last question would be, what is like a tr something that you deeply, deeply believe in, but you know that you're in a very minority in... Like, what's the truth that you believe in that most other people just simply don't? Okay, interesting. Um, so, um, within my church, one of our core beliefs is in the principle of discipleship. And that is basically the belief that if you are not a disciple, and you are not making other disciples, then you are not a Christian. So according to biblical logic, the first disciples were known as Christians and it was actually known as quite a derogatory term. So the reason I believe in that is because obviously I learned that myself and I went through the whole process of learning these things repenting and then getting baptized as it says in acts chapter 236 and i think once i went through that process i realized that wow 
people aren't actually as religious as I thought. Because I think prior to that, I just thought, oh, most of the country is Christian. Most of the world is Christian, actually. But you've really got to look at the specific practices that um, they carry out. Even within my own family, I saw that, you know, my mom had been raised as Christian. But when I asked her some very, very basic questions about Christianity, she couldn't answer them. Or she answered them in a way that wasn't coming from the Bible. It was coming from, like, her own beliefs and her own culture. So I think the principle of discipleship is very, very simple. And my church does a really good job at, tr at teaching it to other people. Um, but it isn't a message that most people will accept. And the Bible even says that. Um, so, yeah. It's a quick follow up then. What are your thoughts on evangelism? Evangelism. So uh, do you mean evangelism as like a branch of Christianity or as, you know, evangelizing? Evangelizing. So evangelizing is something that we are all called to do. So in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20, Jesus tells his disciples to go forth and make more disciples, which is the Great Commission. That's basically what evangelism is. And we believe in that very strongly. So I try to do it as much as I can. So not only do I post, you know, Christian content on TikTok, I also create content for the Great British Bible Talk, which is our life and faith discussion in Oxford. Um, something that I'm really trying to break into is literally walking up to random people on the street and asking them if they want to come. Um, I feel like my confidence hasn't been built up to that level yet, but we will get there. Um, but it is really important because that was how, that was kind of how I was led to getting baptized anyway. Because before that, I was in like a very scary place that I won't dwell too much upon because it's quite, it's quite a lot for our podcast. Um, but I feel like just even being a Christian has saved me from a lot. And so it's like, why wouldn't I want other people to experience that, you know? Thank you so much for sharing that. And final question, what's one message, quote, or saying you wish every educator, teacher, community leader, parent, you know, role model would promote and every kid um, would internalize? Um, okay, what's one thing that, okay. Know yourself and know the people who you're leading. Because I feel like the world is the way it is because of, how much compassion it lacks and so I feel like if you really take time to understand the people you're leading really know their stories know where they've come from that is where they will feel valued by you if you fail to do that then that's basically what would then lead to them hearing it from the wrong people and that's what will cause bad influences to come into their life and then cause further problems down the line so, uh, yeah, that's what I would say. I don't know how powerful that was, but, yeah. Very wise words. Well, um, I, I just want to thank you again. Um, it's great to kind of hear your thoughts. And I, I think I genuinely learned a lot. How have you found the podcast? It's on the spot. I found it really, really interesting, actually. Um, I'll be honest, I wasn't really expecting a lot of the questions that got asked, but it was really good because it kept me on my toes. It kept my brain, you know, working <laughs> over time. So it was really stimulating. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That's right. Well, I didn't know what questions were going to be asked either. So we were both in it in real time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wish you well for um for uh the rest of Lent term. What, what, what do you call it in Oxford? The, this this it's Oxford term? we call it Hillary term. Wish you all the best for Hillary term and once you get to Cambridge, um coffee's on me. In fact, I'm going to Oxford for the Varsity basketball match on the eleventh, and if you're around, um, would it's love funny to. you say that. I'm actually going to Cambridge tomorrow. Oh right, well, well, we can catch up if you want. Of course, of course. Well, thank you so much, David.